Good morning, afternoon, and evening to everyone, and welcome to Global Insights, a live interactive panel discussion which sheds light on big questions currently facing researchers, policymakers, and planners worldwide. Global Insights features experts from leading institutions in the study of international affairs, including Warwick University in the UK, Constanz University in Germany, the American University in Washington, DC, the Institute for Strategic Affairs in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, and the Balsillie School of International Affairs in Canada. Today's live stream production is entitled COVID-19, Migration, Refugees, and Borders. My name is Anne Fitzgerald. I'm the director of the Balsillie School of International Affairs, and I'm delighted to serve as moderator for this week's session. A warm welcome to all participants in the audience, and we have many of you today. Um, if you do have any questions, we would ask that you would direct your questions to the Q&A function on the Zoom panel, and we will do our best to channel those to the appropriate panelist, particularly towards the latter part of the session. We're privileged today to host five well-known experts on issues related to migration and refugees. Dr. Alahona Bebe is a senior legal officer at UNHCR's Office to the African Union and the UN Economic Commission for Africa in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. A former diplomat, he is also a widely published scholar in areas of refugee and displacement law in Africa, human rights and humanitarian law. Maria Koinova is a reader in international relations and chair of the British International Studies Association Working Group on the International Politics of Migration, Refugees and Diaspora at University of Warwick. Alison Mounts is a geographer and Canada Research Chair in Global Migration at the Balsillie School of International Affairs at Laurier University. Alison directs Laurier's International Migration Research Center and edits the journal uh, of politics and space. Tazrina Sajad currently serves as senior professional lecturer in global governance, politics, and security at the School of International Service at the American University in Washington, DC. Her areas of interest include refugees and forcible displacement, transitional justice, gender, and post-conflict governance. And Dr. Maurice Stirl is a Leverhulme Early Career Fellow at the University of Warwick and a member of the activist network Alarm Phone, which supports migrants in distress in the Mediterranean Sea. A warm welcome to all panelists today. Thank you for being with us. I'd like to start with a scene setting question um, to go. Uh, last year, the international community recorded over 70 million migrants. We also saw the development of two new global compacts, one on migration, one in refugees. The world was in the process of implementing these two compacts. What was the situation prior to COVID? Dr. Alahone. What a great question. And uh, thanks for inviting UNHCR to speak on this, at this event. Uh, uh, post uh, pre-COVID-19, the situation as we all know, including the audience, is the, the situation for displaced people and for refugees was rather bleak. Only 3% of the global refugee community have access to tertiary education. 24% have access to higher education. And only 1% of the global refugee population have access to resettling. The decline in access to asylum. Countries were blocking borders and building walls and significant diminish uh, and decline in uh, resource to refugees. And so really this rather distressing picture for refugees. But in 2019, that global compact was significant in a sense that it's an achievement and also recognition of the big challenge that we have. And as we uh, deal with this challenge of COVID-19, uh, there are three things that are embedded in that uh, global compact, which are key. The first is the need to have uh, a global solidarity and burden sharing. I think more than ever, that's exactly what we need. And it's the preeminent principle that's embedded in the global compact. The second is really the need to really embed and incorporate the needs of refugees in national programs. And exactly, I mean, we cannot see refugees or displaced people in isolation, but embed them and include them in national responses. And the third is really the centrality of protection and human rights. What's very clear in this initial stage of even COVID in, in Africa is it's a, a protection and human rights crisis and really building the capacity of 
uh, government to respond to this protection, like the border closure and its impact on asylum and the xenophobia and this vilification of migrants and refugees. We need a human rights response. In that sense, the global compact is more than, uh, you know, uh, very important than ever. Thank you. Thank you very much. Maria Konova, your thoughts pre-COVID. Thank you very much also for the invitation for this panel. Um, the Global Compact on Migration has 23 principles, which we cannot really engage all of them here. But uh, in many ways, uh, I want to add to the previous conversation by emphasizing uh, two things. The first is that uh, states uh, have been the ones uh, to be embedded with the power to implement uh, these decisions. So this is a non-binding uh, uh, treaty. Um, uh, in that sense, uh, states are the ones to make decisions about what and how to embed into their territory. So that's why we can see a lot of unevenness about how uh, different aspects uh, of the uh, global compacts are implemented. And uh, uh, the second one uh, is about um, some novel elements that the Global uh, Compact brought uh, to the fore. And one of them is uh, the ability of uh, refugees uh, to have uh, legal ways in which they can work and contribute uh, to host societies or where they are even temporarily. And in that sense, I want to bring uh, the examples of the Jordan Compact, uh, where even uh, refugees in uh, refugee camps uh, were able to work also in Turkey in much more um, unofficial ways, but still a lot of them have been in a position uh, to work. And uh, uh, the Global Compact uh, has uh, a lot uh, to do with um, how um, business and society and civil society and global diasporas become embedded according to the principles of a, a whole government approach, which means that not simply a certain institution of a state needs to embed these principles, but be mainstreamed. And also a different a number of uh, interest groups in society need to be engaged in businesses. I mean, Germany has been one of the best examples so where it has really enrolled businesses in the integration and discussion about uh, refugees, especially from Syria, about how they can uh, find uh, their way to participate in society and become uh, much more quickly uh, integrated. There are all, many other aspects that have been very selectively integrated. For example, in Eastern European cases, uh, some of them that have not signed or abstained from the signing of the, uh, of the Global Compact, there is some opportunity for uh, uh, refugees to work, but uh, uh, there is not all the time the political will to, to make this happen. And thank you. Thank you. Maurice Sterl, before the pandemic. Uh, so for me, the compacts were never really the milestones. They were haters uh, because they were built, I think, on the premise that agreed mechanisms of what is referred to as migration management could produce forms of safe, orderly, and regular migration in our contemporary world. Right. So the premise that irregular migration could be ended if only migratory movements were ordered more efficiently by states, for me at least, is quite misleading as it deflects from the, the roles that these very states play in making migration disorderly in the first place. So, for example, uh, instead of viewing the global visa regime as a way to create orderly human movements, I think we have to see it as something that irregularizes movements because it is really skewed to allow only the privileged few to move uh, in, in relative ease. Uh, of course, nobody wants to cross the Sahara or the Mediterranean Sea, but the reality is that for many people, especially in the global south, there simply are no other possibilities to migrate in, in quote unquote orderly ways. So for me, the idea that states can humanely manage migration when in fact the paramount motive is deterrence and restricting migration is quite uh, paradoxical at the very heart. So for me, as long as really systemic factors that underpin the need to, for people to migrate in precarious ways are not addressed, uh, no compact will really achieve to manage migration into uh, quote unquote old orderly flows. Thank you. Thank you. Tazrina Sajad, some quick thoughts on pre-COVID situations. Um, I would like to echo many of the very important points my fellow pan panelists have made. At one level, of course, both the compacts are quite comprehensive um, and have had widespread support uh, in terms of uh, if we see who are the ones, how many countries have voted um, uh, in favor, uh, but uh, uh, 
of these documents. But then we sort of look at it a little more carefully and then we see a certain kinds of patterns that emerge, all of them focused on issues of, you know, where the priorities lie, which is obviously in terms of centralizing and so enhancing state power even more and legitimizing their decisions. And second of all, in terms of the question of timeliness. So if you look at the GCM or the Global Compact for Migration, we see, for instance, that five nations voted uh, against it, including the United States, Hungary, the Czech Republic, Poland, and Israel. And there were quite a number of EU members that vote, uh, that did not were in abstention. And with the Global uh, Compact for Refugees, the United States and Hungary, again, were the two nations that didn't vote for the, uh, uh, for the document, and 181 countries voted in favor. And so one of the things that we have to focus on is the fact that if the United States, for instance, is seen as a, a norm entrepreneur, and in terms of seeing as a provider of some of the humanitarian assistance, as well as being in the global north, historically speaking, you know, a context of, of refugee resettlement, problematic as it were, then its withdrawal or its disengagement from both the compacts have had long-standing impacts. And we're going to see that more and more as there isn't any effort to sort of implement the documents. And both of them are, by the way, I would say, um, not ambitious enough in their approach. Um, second of all, they're both non-binding. So again, they remain largely symbolic, although the expectation is that they would have normatic impact on states. Um, but there is a ongoing question of enforcement and accountability, which remain key concerns. Again, there is very few teeth with regard to both the documents, and that means that few actions actually need to be taken by states by, uh, by specific uh, timeframes. And we have seen with the sustainable development goals that, you know, having specific timelines can sort of push countries towards making certain decisions. And that more or less doesn't exist. And as I mentioned before, the timing is very important. At one level, both the documents are extremely timely, given we are living in a context, uh, uh, a global environment, particularly uh, emanating from the global north, but certainly we are seeing resonance in countries in the global south where there is anti-immigrant and xenophobic sentiments. But at the same time, you know, when countries are thinking more in terms of insularity and nationalistic tendencies, it's easy for many of these countries to sort of ignore the basic principles and commitments to the compacts. And finally, of course, that means regressive policies that are being adopted by EU member countries, non-EU member, but European nation states, the United States, Australia, as well as other contexts. That means that there's constant punishing of migrants and asylum seekers, and that exacerbates questions of human rights violations. And that is even pre-COVID. Um, the language of border management is very clear in both the documents. And I feel that in, in, in many contexts, they're remain in contradiction to human rights, non-discrimination, and gender responsiveness. And as far as uh, questions of really dealing with them as systemic problems are concerned, the compacts, I would say, have had huge problems in terms of being able to implement the basics. Because again, when states are prioritized in such very specific ways, then the question of migrant experiences and refugee experiences and displaced people's experiences are not centered as much as they should be. Thanks, Tessera. And I'm going to uh, jump to uh, the current situation and go to Alison Mounts from Canada. Alison, um, you look at flows to and across North America. What uh, has COVID done to impact those these flows? Thanks, Anne. I mean, I'm not going to speculate about too much in the future, but I think there are some safe observations that we can make today about what's happening. Um, one of the things that I've, I've observed is that the pandemic really uh, exacerbates and illuminates um, disparities and inequalities that were present already. So in the kind of rapid shutting down that we've experienced of borders, um, we see that people who had access to resources that's expressed through their mobility, their ability to move, um, they might still have access to those. So in the extreme, we, we read all these stories about billionaires taking off to you know, remote islands, to compounds that they'd set up. Um, but of course, people who don't have access to resources, um, people who are displaced, people who are seeking protection are facing more limbo, um, less mobility, uh, fewer paths to or legal options um, for entry, for seeking protection, for seeking asylum. Um, so we know that, for example, in North America, borders shut down, but not for everyone, not in all ways. Um, trade continued to cross the border, medical professionals, um, certain things remained open. 
Whereas for those for whom things were always difficult, things uh, shut down more. So of course the pandemic affects everyone, but not equally. And I think we're seeing that these kind of disparities and inequalities are, are exacerbated. Thank you. Uh, Maria Konova, the impact on labor migration and precarious jobs. Yeah, well, today we are looking into uh, the migrants and quite celebrated uh, as terms of the heroes of the NHS and other uh, health mm -hmm. systems. Uh, yet uh, there are a lot of other aspects that we don't see with regard to labor migration. And I want to bring two examples. Uh, the one is from Europe and intra-European movements and the other is from the Middle East. Um, Eastern European migrants, uh, Romanians, Bulgarians, uh, and others uh, who have been working in agricultural jobs in the UK, in uh, the Netherlands, uh, Germany, and other countries, um, have experienced uh, a lot of difficulties uh, in this period. In the first place, because uh, either jobs may have been lost or certain uncertainties may have kicked in into society, and they have been seeking uh, ways to return home but then also the borders being closed have been creating a lot of uh, problems for them. So they become what a guardian called recently stranded migrants. And uh, thinking in the future about how uh, these precarious jobs has, uh, can really be changed uh, really uh, matters. As a matter of irony, with regards to the Brexit situation, especially of these populations, uh, uh, because of the need to pick up uh, crops uh, and other produce, uh, uh, some charter flights were uh, brought up uh, from uh, uh, these parts of the world to bring uh, people and expertise uh, into supporting the, uh, the system. And the other example is uh, from the Middle East and um, uh, places uh, in the Gulf area where uh, usually migrants uh, are dependent on uh, contracts and their visas are based on uh, ways in which uh, only um, sponsors, uh, work sponsors can uh, give them uh, authority to work. So in Qatar recently there has been uh, uh, what uh, one person called the cordon sanitaire, so uh, sh shielding off areas in where migrants, labor migrants, officially labor migrants work uh, from the rest of the areas uh, and creating unequal conditions between the people within that areas and, and people without. So uh, what uh, my colleague uh, Alison earlier said, uh, exacerbating these uh, um, inequalities is quite visible, but also this leveling effect for migrants because they're, they're at the front line of uh, supporting uh, different, different systems in order then to function. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, Maurice, uh, what can you tell us about how European countries have responded to the maritime migration movements in particular? So uh, European countries have really used or misused the pandemic to justify ramping up border restrictions in the Mediterranean. So we've seen Italy and Malta, for example, declare the harbors unsafe and closed. And especially Malta has really engaged in systematic human rights abuses. And the list here is endless, but I just do want to give a few examples. So a few weeks ago, Malta, but also the EU border agency Frontex, were monitoring migrant boats in distress from the sky, uh, but failed to intervene. Uh, in one instant, 12 people uh, died, drowned and starved to death. Um, in another case, the Maltese forces have sabotaged boats. In another case, they have used a fleet of private ships to push migrants back to Libya. And again, other cases, they have given migrants indeed fuel and engine after they couldn't deter them back to Libya to move on to Italy. And these practices, of course, are usually associated with smuggling, right? In addition, uh, now, still now today, hundreds of people are kept offshore in Malta, uh, off Malta's shore in detention, uh, floating detention centers, and some have uh, gone on hunger strike and attempted suicide. So the coronavirus is really being used to justify these actions that, of course, breach a number of human rights and maritime laws and conventions. And, but so far, what is also quite shocking is Europe has remained completely silent on these violations at its external borders. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Alahone, can you tell us a bit about how African countries and the African Union is responding uh, since the onset of COVID? Well, that question, just before I address that question briefly and just uh, briefly to respond to the, uh, the 
the, the, the statement that you know the global compact is really symbolic. And actually what we see on the ground is how useful it is even to really evaluate what's happening on the ground in response to COVID-19. It's really established new partnership for humanitarians with new financial institutions and development actors, even as we respond to COVID-19. Government institutions that we normally, you know, didn't have strong relationship like Ministry of Health, there are already structure that was established pre uh, COVID-19, which are really instrumental as we respond. We have, it's not really correct to say that there is no accountability, even though there are hundreds of pledges that were made in the first global refugee forum. And again, there were pledges that we have monitoring mechanism to see to what extent. Of course, this is not neglecting the fact that the COVID-19 is a significant challenge uh, 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 to, to those countries. At the continental level, the African Union, I think I must really acknowledge the leadership of South Africa, which is currently chairing the African Union, which is also really showing significant leadership at the national level, uh, mobilized resources and also leadership to call for a stimulus package and also testing and equipment and also working with the leadership in Ethiopia, Prime Minister, uh, uh, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed and also others in Senegal and Ghana and, and Kenya and Rwanda. And I think there is a immense political movement that's happening in Africa. And as Secretary General just yesterday said, Africa is actually an example how to early respond. But of course, the coming weeks and months are going to be a test for to what extent that's effective. But uh, the, the, the initial steps are quite, quite, quite uh, um, promising. Together with international, just to conclude, with the uh, Institute of Security Studies, UNHCR has published a policy brief in COVID-19. And we said, the conclusion is this swift continental response will face three basic realities. The first is conflict is happening in many parts of Africa, in the Sahel, in Libya, in Horn of Africa, in DRC, despite the call by the Secretary General for global ceasefire. And there are no sufficient resources. And also the protection, and Maurice and other colleagues have been mentioning the serious protection and human rights uh, you know, uh, uh, violations that are taking place. So those are going to be a real test for the success in Africa. But I think there are promising steps that are uh, taking place. Over. Thank you very much. Tazrina Sajad, I want to move to that issue of protection of refugees. Who is bearing the largest burden at the moment? So um, I think, you know, um, the conversation about refugee protection and refugee flows and what constitutes a crisis is something that, you know, I think the Western world, quote unquote, woke up to in 2015. It was as if the refugee crisis wasn't happening or hadn't happened in the past or, you know, framing it in terms of a crisis um, as if, you know, Europe was facing it for the first time. And, you know, we had never seen such large numbers before. And these are all based on fallacies, because if we look at the statistics and looking at the historical trend and pattern of how many refugees have flown and to what areas. We see that historically and even today, countries in the global south have continued to be the largest refugee um, uh, hosts of both de jure and de facto refugees. So countries like Turkey as a result of the Syrian crisis, but Pakistan as a result of an ongoing situation in Afghanistan, Uganda, Sudan, Bangladesh as a result of the Rohingya, Lebanon, continue to be the largest refugee hosts in the world. And then if we also sort of consider uh, in terms of per capita, uh, here again, we see again the prominence of countries in the global south, which is again Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey, Chad, South Sudan, Djibouti. And the exceptions, of course, are countries like Malta and Sweden. Uh, in the top 10 list. And if you look at the larger numbers, Germany makes it to the top, one of the top refugee hosting countries. And again, it's only since 2015. So we lose historical perspective uh, when we talk about the refugee crisis as if it's a contemporary one rather than something that has been going on. Um, I will also emphasize that in many of these contexts, refugees arrive in large numbers very quickly. Um, so for instance, as a result of geographical proximity, as a result of the fact that border restrictions in many of these countries are not anywhere compared to what we see in the United States or Australia or countries in the European Union and in the European continent. We, um, the, the porosity of borders um, 
also means that large numbers do arrive. So just to give you a very contemporary example, that in a matter of about a couple of months, over 700,000 Rohingyas had uh, arrived in, in Bangladesh in August 2017. And together with the numbers that existed before, we are well over a million people who are already seeking refuge in a very uh, you know, overpopulated context. Um, I will say here, in terms of COVID-19, I, uh, I would argue that you know, this creates a different dynamic of emergency when we talk about forcible displacement. At one level, of course, you have, um, uh, you know, a situation where um, you have a, a, a pressure where you have people who are being forced to flee, um, and it may not be directly COVID-19, it's an economic crisis that sort of follows on its heels, that's pushing people outwards. And at another level, you know, border restrictions in many contexts are either keeping people in lockdown or obviously pushing some people across borders at a time when border militarization in many of these contexts are, are higher. Um, Thanks, Tazarina. I'm just gonna have to come in and, and, and get, get around some of the other panelists, but um, we'll come back to you. Maria Canova, can we go to the camps and talk about protection in and around the camps? What, what, what's happening there? Yeah, I mean, it does matter about where refugees are, whether they're in camp or outside of that. So in camps, uh, there have been a lot of uh, information uh, in, uh, in the media about uh, problems uh, with uh, regards to how one isolate themselves and how sanitary conditions are available and how much uh, opportunities it is, uh, there are for, uh, for COVID-19 not to penetrate. I mean, there's very much of an idea that uh, refugee camps camps are ticking bombs uh, with regards to COVID-19 and they, they need to be managed very well, which uh, creates a lot of issues with regard to freedom and sealing off, etc. But basic, uh, basic things that a lot of uh, us can do is to donate uh, money for soap and for anything that we can support uh, uh, people in refugee camps uh, and that can be done uh, from uh, the comfort of, of living at home and isolating on this part of the world. Um, uh, one would think that the situation of people who are outside of the camps might be better because this is generally the preferred situation by many, but in these uh, insecure times uh, there have been a lot of examples of people who really try to shy away from even going on the streets in order not to be picked up by, by the police uh, and even staying away from uh, seeking uh, health uh, support uh, in the services because they fear deportation and linking of the one uh, system of health uh, uh, care to the deportation system. So in that sense, being in squatted environments or being risking to be in situation of uh, uh, homelessness is a very important uh, part of the life of refugees outside of the camps. Thank you. Dr. Alahone, you're in a country that is host to hundreds of thousands of refugees and neighboring countries as well, like South Sudan. What are your key concerns in these settlements at the moment? And uh, what a question. I think all of us are really immensely concerned about the state of, uh, um, you know, refugees and displaced people across the world. It's not just in Africa, but, you know, in Africa, we have 7.8 million refugees you know, according to IDMC, we have more than 19 million uh, internally displaced persons. And so the immense challenge in Africa is just staggering. But that's key protection issues. I would agree with uh, my co-panelists in saying that some of the key protection issues, and we are very much, as UNHCR, as our High Commissioner, Filippo Grande, consistently mentioned, we are worried about the laws, this uh, very stringent laws that are put in place which may be very difficult to remove in the near future. Some of them are placed to be there for a very long time. So we are very much worried about the border closures and, and the, the diminishing asylum. The education crisis, of course, I am a parent myself. My, my kids are out, the, the school is closed, but there are alternative mechanisms for, for refugees. There isn't such when you don't have access to radio, internet, ICT infrastructure, and for many in refugee camps or even outside of camps, school is safety, it's protection. School is where you get your meal, nutrition, access. So it's multiple crises refugees and internally displaced persons uh, and face. And the mental 
uh, and psychological pressure that comes with this. You know, if you, you have, if you have been following uh, some of the operations UNHCR and partners from Libya, we have been engaged in humanitarian evacuation you know, from Libya to you know, Kigat, uh, in Rwanda and Niger. That had to be suspended. Resettlement options have been suspended. And you have seen the statement, to, joint statement between IOM and UNHCR. And the kind of psychological pressure that comes with this, knowing that, you are not going to be resettled after your case is finalized and immense psychological process and, 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 and pressure and the psychosocial impact and sexual violence and negative coping mechanism. There is a lot to worry about, Anne. Yeah, thank you very much. Alison Mounts, your work has uh, touched on detention centers. What are your concerns in these crowded areas at the moment? Similarly, uh, the situation is quite serious and there are many concerns. Of course, the pandemic hits at a historic moment when detention was proliferating globally. Um, and we're, we're seeing really a panoply of responses by governments in their decision making around these concerns about the rapid spread. Of course, within the facilities, the concerns are that it's nearly impossible for people to physically distance. Um, there's a lack of protective equipment such as masks available to both workers and detainees, um, a lack of testing available and then generally access, inadequate access to medical care when people do need it. Um, so what's happening, some governments are releasing people from detention. So for example, that's happening to some extent here in Canada, which doesn't have a huge population compared to its neighbor in the United States in detention to begin with. Um, but we've seen that cut in about, uh, by about 50%, going from a few hundred to under 150 people in detention in Canada. Whereas in the US, of course, the situation is much more dire, uh, in part because of numbers. Um, so in the US, those numbers are closer to about 32, sorry, 38,000 as of um, March when the pandemic hit. Um, some very large facilities uh, where people are crowded and all of those issues are, are extreme that I mentioned, all of those concerns. And so we're seeing large outbreaks. Um, one of these is in Ote, which is a large facility in San Diego where the first COVID-19 related death happened on May 7th um, and where some 700 people have tested positive. Um, putting many, many people, many more people at risk. And the last thing I'll mention is that another thing that's happening with the, the US-based facilities is that we see uh, the Trump administration and the Department of Homeland Security accelerating its enforcement program. So accelerating uh, sorry, deportations from those facilities. And there are especially concerns about unaccompanied minors being deported quickly and people who've tested positive being deported so that it's a mechanism of spread um, to other countries. Thank you. And Maurice, what about movements across the Mediterranean? What about the protection of those refugees? Yes, so there has been a dramatic decline in Mediterranean crossings over recent weeks, uh, including also in the Aegean region. So overall, about 19,000 people have arrived in Europe, which is really few in comparison with uh, prior years. Uh, so the corona crisis has, of course, made it more difficult in a way to travel in groups. And I've also had that some smuggling networks have scaled down operations due to the effects of the virus. But I think what is really crucial to explain or to explain the decline in crossings has been the border restrictions that I've already mentioned earlier, because they have prompted mass interception, mass deterrence campaigns that occur, for example, in places like Libya, Turkey, and Morocco, and so on. And so it's due to these deterrence measures that, for example, in the case of Libya, of 1,000 people, around 1,000 people who fled the coast, uh, fewer than half of that uh, reached Europe. Um, and of course, many others were prevented from even getting onto these boats. Uh, in the Aegean region, um, only a few dozen people have crossed to the uh, Greek islands in April. And again, here the reason is not that people do not want to reach the Greek islands any longer, but that the Turkish Coast Guard is intercepting migrants en masse on Europe's behalf. And also the Greek Coast Guard is really systematically pushing migrant boats back so that they wouldn't reach the Greek islands. So I think why, you know, we are easily thinking about Mediterranean uh, migration in terms of the COVID crisis and, you know, try to speculate around the decline in terms of people being maybe too scared to reach Europe or Italy in particular, where the spread of the coronavirus is of course very dramatic. We sometimes lose focus and we have to think 
that uh, it is mostly due to these border restrictions that we see in places of departure and also at sea that um, um, fewer people are, are making the crossings. Well, you, uh, there's lots of questions coming in on border controls and closures. So, um, Tazarina, can I come to you? There's been a lot of enthusiasm about, um, in some countries, about walls as effective fortification measures. Can you come? Are, are they effective? Right. Well, uh, you're right. I mean, there has been a lot of enthusiasm about wall building, um, and we see this emanating really from the global north, and it has sort of picking up traction in elsewhere in the world. Um, just to give you some numbers of the over 70 fortifications that have been built since 1945, more than half were actually constructed between 2000 and 2017. And while the purpose of walls previously was about sovereignty and territorial demarca demarcation, nowadays it's more about you know, control of migration uh, from countries in the global south. And so when we talk about walls, of course, uh, there's a barbed wire fencing for poorer countries that can actually afford it. So for instance, Bangladesh put up, recently put up a barbed wire fencing with regard to the Rohingya camps. But you know, you have ditches, you have guard towers, you have minefields. But obviously the sophisticated walls are where you know, the European Union sort of dominates. Um, and certainly you know, we see this in the context of uh, Australia and in the United States, uh, particularly with the Trump administration talking about the US-Mexico wall. Um, and there is a seduction of technological advancement in a part and part package of this. So if you can use sensitive radars, if you, you can use sort of crewless aircrafts, you can use biometric surveillance systems, that's also part of the wall building enterprise. Um, I would also say that outside of the technological borders that are being created and in, in proliferation, we also have different kinds of bureaucratic walls that are being built in terms of greater visa restrictions, uh, in terms of talking about um, you know, family separation procedures in, in terms of third country agreements. And one of my panelists mentioned that with, with third countries who now serve as gatekeepers for the European Union and the United States is starting to do that with Central American countries to act as gatekeepers for migration for the purpose of border control. In all of this, of course, what we don't talk about, you know, uh, with regard to the eff efficacy of borders, and by the way, the literature and the science, uh, the, the uh, scholarship behind it doesn't support that the, there's a clear line between migration migration patterns in terms of their actual and long-term decrease and building actual fortifications. Um, the fact that mobility actually becomes more difficult and expensive, and that, that is why we have larger number of visa overstayers. The fact that there's an increase of, of merging of drug and human smuggling networks, that there's a, an expansion of human smuggling enterprises, uh, there's a rise of vigilante groups, there's violation of property rights, environmental destruction, and the most important of all is, of course, the lives lost whether their lives lost in the Mediterranean, in the deserts, in transit, where the focus if, if always is about citizens, right, in terms of preserving citizen rights and citizens' uh, interests and so on and so forth. We, it's, very ignored to, so, uh, it's very easy to ignore the thousands of lives that are lost every year, um, you know, of migrants uh, in distress, um, about which we don't really pay as much attention to. Thank you. You've mentioned the European Union. Maurice, can I come back to you and get your views on uh, what the European Union is doing here in terms of governance? Yes, so on the surface, there have been many conflicts over migration in the European context, right? We see these constant kind of bickering um, between member states and the institutions and also among member states themselves. And so these conflicts are for me not necessarily new. Um, so EU member states, especially those situated at the geographical edges of the union have a long decried a sort of lack of solidarity, especially in terms of migrant relocations. And while I think to an extent this is a valid concern and critique, I would uh, caution against simply taking these conflicts that we see play out, especially in the media at face value and look a bit uh, deeper instead. And I say this especially for two reasons. So as I said earlier, uh, Mediterranean crossings have really gone down overall, right? Um, but arrivals are still staged as a sort of invasion. And in particular, over the last few weeks, Malta has called out uh, Europe or has called to Europe uh, you know, to show more solidarity. But we have to also sometimes keep the numbers in mind. So over the last six years, 5,500 people have arrived to Malta. And of course, it's a small country. But in comparison, 1.2 million people have arrived in Greece at the same time. So it's all quite relative. And this sort of narrative of invasion 
is being produced by political parties quite often to whip up uh, public support uh, for restrictive measures. And quite often also in the Maltese context, uh, and also in the Italian context, uh, previously under Salvini and so on, to distract from other issues, right? So there is uh, then also a second reason, um, I think, to not fall for these quite the theatrical conflicts in Europe. So all EU member states and institutions are completely united in deterring migrants in the Mediterranean. So while there may be some conflicts about uh, migrant relocations after arrival, there's absolute unity in terms of you know, supporting border control in third countries, for example, in Libya, you know, so we have seen how the Libyan uh, forces that also include former smuggling networks are financed, equipped, and politically legitimized so that migrants are captured and detained and tortured. So I think we should not lose sight of this when so much is made of the conflicts in Europe over migration. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, Dr. Alahone. We've seen a lot of uh, good practices uh, develop from different African countries. Are there good practices concerning border management and governance of the migration issue? Uh, thank you, Anne, for that question. Just before that, um, just to briefly respond to some of the questions, and I think I agree, uh, especially for Western liberal countries, I think there is a need to really show uh, leadership in uh, compliance with international norms and standards. This has this is going to have really profound implication for multicultural arrangements and for for uh, global leadership. And so so far, according to UNHCR, more than 60, 160 countries have uh, put in place you know restrictive border closures and. More than 50 of them didn't make any exception to asylum. And this is a or refugees, and this has significant implications for the refugee protection. So I think it's essential for liberal democracies to really stand up and stand with and together with refugees and really make that. And there are practical ways that can, that can uh, happen. Uh, lessons from Africa. And there are a few cases. We talked about education crisis. And recently, we have been really working as UNHCR with, for example, the government of Zambia trying to get license to broadcast, uh, you know, education program for refugees, you know, getting a license to broadcast through radio programs. Governments doing that. In Ethiopia, for instance, the government recently declared that it will open six, about 17 entry points around the border. No closing border, but opening them as a logical way of managing borders. If you put, you know, health screening around those entry points and allow people to move around, including refugees, we have now new arrivals coming from uh, uh, South Sudan. And if you put uh, in, you know, those mechanisms to allow, you know, the screening process and then uh, uh, quarantine arrangement. And I think those are uh, uh, good examples. But then we shouldn't really also shy away from the fact that in urban setting, refugees are destitute. In many countries where, you know, refugees and urban setting, they are still facing significant challenges. So all the pictures are not rosy. Uh, in, in Africa, especially in countries that are facing conflicts in uh, Burkina Faso, you, know, you talk about Cameroon, mm -hmm. we're in the Sahel region, and we are extremely concerned about the issue, uh, the, 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 the challenge uh, uh, internal displaced persons and refugees are facing. But of course, there are good examples as well in terms of border management, access to uh, national services. And in South Africa, for instance, in Cape Town, you see refugee run programs providing assistance not only to refugees, but also to host community, really showing the kind of agencies uh, refugees have. Thank, thanks very much. Alison, your thoughts on safe havens? Sure. Um, just to add to the, the comments that my, the, the observations my colleagues have already made, I think, again, the pandemic um, exacerbates things that were already present, trends that were happening. And this is especially the case for people who are, who are displaced and seeking protection in the form of asylum. So for years, paths to asylum have been shutting down bit by bit. And it's often the case in the world of migration that governments will use moments of crisis to advance their enforcement agendas. And I think Maurice and others have given many examples of this. Um, so that it's getting harder and harder to get geographically um, to a place where one can legally make a claim for asylum. And so what we see globally is that countries of the global north are effectively containing displacement uh, or people displaced in the global south so that approximately 84% of displaced peoples remain in regions of origin. Um, and so I think Alejon's 
comment is very important. Um, how will countries collaborate, perhaps to go back to where we began with the compacts? Um, how can such um, international tools of global governance be effectively um, brought to the fore so that those trends that were already underway um, to shut paths down, for example, for people seeking protection um, can, be, can be reopened. And I appreciate the examples that, that Alejon was offering. Thank you. Maria Cornova, there is a recurring theme that the global pandemic is, is really making people more human. Do you think there's going to be more human empathy towards migrants? We're getting loads of questions on what's going to happen moving forward. What's your thought on that? I think that uh, you know the world can go different ways and uh, this trope is a very optimistic one and I will give you one example from the border between Bosnia and Croatia which has been very much implicating in pushback of uh, transit migrants from Croatia that is part of the European Union to Bosnia that is not yet so this is the European border per se. Um, and yet a lot of uh, violent events have been happening. Uh, people have been stripped of their, the uh, the, their uh, clothes uh, or recently during the COVID crisis when it was much more difficult to try even to attempt to pass, uh, some people were sprayed with paint. There are like very big uh, human rights violations, I think uh, that uh, a lot of uh, other uh, panelists have already said. But on the other side, the crisis is open in these spaces, even if we are confined to smaller spaces in which we interact with ourselves, families and others, uh, to reach out uh, in that other border of the empathy developing with regard to others. I think that the charities have been uh, definitely much more prone to, uh, to accept and, and uh, advertise for, uh, for self, as I mentioned before, but also for other kinds of uh, um, ways in which people can be um, uh, engaged. Also the visibility of migrants with regards to NHS and others is uh, potentially uh, opening spaces to uh, uh, reshape uh, ideas about where the migrants are. And there are countless of other examples of uh, uh, ways in which uh, uh, sporadic acts uh, of uh, support has been happening both ways. People in the Devon area, for example, Syrian refugees have volunteered about helping the elderly. Uh, NGO has been trying to uh, put uh, the cooking classes of uh, different uh, 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 migrant chefs uh, online in order to expose them to other ways of uh, uh, projecting their skills and finding ways uh, of that. So I think there, are, there is a lot of space and my appeal definitely to everybody is like to look in the space between within about how they can contribute to alleviating the suffering. Thank you very much. I want to look at the future of refugee and migration governance. And we've got a lot of policymakers in the audience as well. So if you can combine your thoughts uh, with some recommendations or key considerations that you would share with them. Maurice, um, will we see shifts in European border security moving forward? Um, so I think the COVID-19 angle is quite often used to, you know, detect sort of novel dynamics in terms of border control. But I think we should also stress the continuity here when we look toward the future, right? So we see that um, border control practices, especially in the global north, are exacerbating and becoming even more violent. But there are longer trajectories here. And I just want to point to two. One uh, of these trajectories is to outsource border control to undemocratic regimes, you know, so basically to have other countries and governments do the dirty work for Europe. And we call this the border externalization process, right, where Northern African countries, Turkey, but also countries in the Sahel and so on are deployed as Europe's frontier guards. And not only third country governments are part of the process, and I think this is important to emphasize, but also sub-state actors and militias, right? So, you know, we have started to speak not only of the militarization of border control, but also of the militiarization, right? And then there's a so second uh, longer trajectory, um, which is, as I mentioned before, the securitization of the sea. So this has also not started due to COVID-19, but, you know, it's a much longer process. So what we see now is an increase of surveillance efforts, no, by the EU in the sky to monitor migrant boats, why withdrawing from the sea, right? So not to be drawn into rescue operations. And at the same time, we see uh, how NGO rescuers are still systematically obstructed from going out at sea and rescuing. 
Um, so on the one hand, to prevent rescues to Europe, and on the other hand, to force out witnesses of human rights abuses at sea. So while I think I totally agree uh, with the comments that you know, we see border security practices exacerbating and escalating and so forth, I think we have to keep in mind these longer trajectories of EU border control that will, also, of course, also reach into the future. Thank you. Tazrina, what about the future of irregular migration? Um, I think, you know, um, I would agree with my panelist, uh, particularly Maurice, when she, he said that, you know, the new normal, if that is COVID-19, and if the pushback is only up to the point of where it used to be pre-COVID-19, we haven't certainly gone enough because there have been larger patterns of the criminalization of migration, the securitization of migration, both in terms of political rhetoric that has been politically expedient uh, in the short term, and then in terms of the great industrialized sort of capacity of technological industries and military industries to be tied into that, you know, profit sort of making enterprises that allow a migration control to be such a lucrative industry. I think those are the issues that need to be tackled, particularly in countries of the global north where this is much more established. A second issue is to sort of uh, focus on the fact that, you know, um, this constant, you know, uh, as I mentioned earlier before in terms of, you know, the gatekeeper uh, mentality. Um, and I think that the language that is used in the context of the European U Union is the externalization of borders. We might see a greater practices of that because as people become more aware, maybe there are certain pockets of empathy that emerge, um, you know, and there are certain areas of pushback, then it's easier to then let other countries where you can say, well, this is because of non-democratic practices or it's not our problem to be the sort of vanguards of questions of migration control. And that is also something that has long-term sort of effects. Um, I would say that, you know, in terms of thinking about the economic impact, hunger will continue to be a bigger sort of challenge with many of these uh, irregular migrants, whether they fall clearly in the definition of refugees or whether they're stateless populations, asylum seekers, internal migrants who we don't necessarily talk about, um, as well as, you know, other mobile populations. And until and unless there's a recognition of the fact that, you know, economic crises is the one that uh, multiple levels of economic crises and unemployment tied to that would, would be the fact that, you know, a lot of these countries will now start blaming or, you know, desperate populations or citizens will start blaming migrants for limited number of jobs will lead to a greater sort of turbulence until and unless there is a better addressing of these issues. And finally, I would say not to rely on the goodwill of African nation states and smaller nation states in Latin America or in Asia uh, to sort of continue to bear the brunt. I think there is a tendency to sort of congratulate a country and sort of uplift a country, you know, in, in bigger public spaces and say, you know, you've done great, you know, in, in these uh, climates, you, ha you are accepting refugees, so on and so forth. But again, not addressing the foundational issues of either drivers of conflict or in terms of burden sharing, what is termed, or in terms of equitable response to uh, uh, migrations of people. And I think until and unless those issues are addressed, then we actually don't make much movement forward uh, with or without. Thank you very much. Alison Mounts, can I just ask you, loads of questions are coming in about cutbacks to NGO budgets. Um, concerns that people researching these issues won't have access for, for quite some time. What, what can you say about the future of research on this issue and how the pandemic will change human migration? Sure, I think again, we can, I agree with my colleagues that we can look to the, to the patterns and trends of the past. We can say with certainty that people will not stop migrating. Although we have, yes, a, a, a current um, pause and crossings, not a pause, but uh, an a extreme shutdown of borders that we're experiencing. Um, so I think this invites us to return to some of our roots as migration scholars. Um, to ask basic questions about where people who are ultimately resilient, where do they continue to go? Because they have to continue to go somewhere um, to survive, to seek livelihood, to seek protection. Uh, how can we um, rethink how we do research and how can we rethink how we write policy? So it's very well known to go back to the beginning of our conversation about the compacts that the, the tools of global governance of migration, whether um, we're talking about compacts, conventions, or um, national immigration policies, are highly reactive. Um, they are often written in response to crises. 
And where I find hope right now is in the stepping back, the invitation to look at the big picture. So for example, in Canada, we're having conversations about, is this an opportunity to rethink how we care for the elderly, to rethink a national daycare strategy? It's also an invitation to rethink the categories and policies of immigration and, and refugee um, management, resettlement, and so on. So in, in what ways are the existing policies effective? In what ways may some of them be causing harm? And how can we step back to bring actual migrations and movements into, into better alignment um, with demands in labor market, with opportunities for work, um, so that we don't have such large unauthorized migration movements, so that people have better access to, to movement and protections? Thank you very much. Dr. Alahone in Ethiopia, you're a policymaker and a scholar. So what are your thoughts on the future of migration governance? Uh, thank you, Anne. I think there is a tendency to think radical and to come up with uh, so many policy options. But I think the blueprint, as we discussed, and I think my panelists will agree with me, is that the, blu the blueprint is already there. We talked about the global compact, and they are uh, you know, a sort of a clear blueprint, and we don't need to rewrite them. They are already there and they are very useful. For instance, if we accelerate, uh, you know, access to social safety net and health and education services, as many countries, as I said, more than 700 countries have already made pledges, not only countries, by the way, you know, like uh, other actors, you know, development and, you know, NGOs and civil society. And so this is a tremendous resource. So the blueprint is already there for the future governance of a refugee response. This is going, if we implement that, that's sufficient. But now I think I agree with uh, also my panelists that, you know, like uh, the, the Western world and everybody needs to show leadership and compliance with international human rights law, refugee law, acts, and that's how you even show solidarity. Solidarity with the rest of the world, open up borders, manage borders responsibly, allow access. And for instance, one interesting thing that we have seen uh, even as UNHCR is, now, as we speak, many European countries, several of them have started, you know, the RSD process through like a remote, you know, interviewing process. This is an opportunity for us to learn lessons from this and how to scale it up so that we can speed up because unfortunately there were a lot of inefficiencies in that process. This is an opportunity and some countries are already open to that, to that, that conversation. The other thing is really about IDPs, which are really missing you know like in our conversation internal displacement massive numbers across the world and even the secretary general now acknowledge everybody development actors you know western governments and everybody acknowledge that these are people to whom we're not paying sufficient attention that's why now there is a high level even panel looking at what should we how should we even approach that even as international organization our response is significantly it has several gaps government sometimes they are unwilling or unable to respond to the needs of IDPs and I think how to respond to the needs of IDPs and find solutions for those populations are, are quite key and I really agree with I'm Alison and other colleagues who talked about finally about resources already the United Nations system and partners ask for billions of dollars and Western governments are also struggling and how do we creatively mobilize the resources to respond to those needs and i think this is going to be a conversation even in the future over to you thank you very much um maria sorry very quickly there's a lot of questions coming in on the role of diasporas i know you, you chaired groups on this could you comment quickly on the role of diasporas going forward i think that uh, the role of diasporas is very important within the global compacts idea about the whole society approach and uh, this is a resource that hasn't been uh, explored enough uh, in the world while we look into some world bank data today that uh, is expecting a drop of uh, global remittances of 20 percent uh, due to the covid 19 crisis uh, compared to five percent uh, during 2008 and 2009 uh, financial crisis this is uh, uh, going to bring a huge uh, uh, impact uh, not simply on the diasporas themselves but also on the countries uh, of origin in countries like Armenia and Tajikistan or Bangladesh that have uh, uh, more than 18 to 20 percent of their GDP per capita 
coming from uh, remittances uh, is really um, going to be a big problem and in, in expose a lot of people to poverty. So taking diasporas uh, really uh, seriously as an actor uh, embedded in processes, and this has been started in a certain way by way of the World Bank and uh, IOM, International Organization of Migration, is working on this. There is much more uh, potential to harness, not simply financially, what diasporas are sometimes complaining about, but about transfer expertise. Uh, uh, recently, we've seen a, a lot of people from the global north give advice about how to deal with COVID-19 in the global south, and uh, one Armenian case is uh, right there. So it is important to develop deeper processes, not ad, ad hoc processes, uh, not something that is really one-time event, but long-term integration of diasporas in all kinds of ways in which uh, uh, support can be dealt with, not simply financially, but by way of expertise and the very good will of diasporas. Thank you so much to all panelists. We could talk all day about this. The questions are just flowing in, but I've got to bring it to a close. Thank you so much. Thank you to the audience. We hope you've enjoyed it and we hope you'll join us again in two weeks time for our next Global Insights panel entitled COVID-19 and Gender Divides. Until then, stay safe and thanks so much. <laughs>